we are again, gathered around the Word of God. God has something for us again today. May our hearts be open to receive. May the Holy Spirit have free access to us to instruct us out of God's Word. We've been teaching, and it's in line with the calling of God upon my life and upon this ministry, preparing people for the soon return of the Lord. And in keeping with that, we are teaching out of the book of Ephesians, and it's certainly a book that can prepare people to live unto the Lord so that we are preparing, we are in preparation for what is coming our way. We cited the fact that the epistle of the Ephesians moves on, teaching us until it gets to the place where it tells us that our business is to put on the whole armor of Almighty God, to put on the whole armor of God that we may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil, because we are not wrestling against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual wickedness in the heavenlies. Therefore, we are to take on the whole armor of God that we may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. So we said that the epistle really moves us toward preparing for the evil day. The name of the, the subject is preparation for what's coming our way, and we cited that that fact is there. The evil day is coming our way, and in these days, we have visible, tangible evidence that our world is getting worse, that the challenges before us are heavier and stronger, and that we are to be more prepared because before the glorious day comes, and that day is coming, we will have to face on this earth what the Word of God calls the evil day. It pertains to the end times, to the last days. Let no one deceive you about this. This is an inescapable fact. And in keeping with what we see in the epistle to the Ephesians, it teaches us two things. One is the glorious relationship that we have come into through Jesus Christ, God's Son, our Savior. And then it teaches us how we should be uh, deporting ourselves, how we should behave, what we should how we should order our lives in the light of the great and glorious revelation of the relationship that we've come into through Christ. In other words, we have been told that we have a special place in this earth as the believers, as the people of God. The epistle is addressed to the saints which are at Ephesus and to the church in general. As a matter of fact, there was a circular letter to the Ephesians that uh, evidently got lost. The Apostle Paul makes references, makes reference to it. Uh, uh, the other epistle that he had written them, which was to be seen and shared by the other churches, wrong. But the, the fact is, the epistle tells us about preparing for what's coming our way, preparation for what's coming our way. And we notice that the Word of God speaks of the dispensation of the fullness of times. That's coming our way. The, the, the Lord has been moving uh, human affairs toward that period where he speaks of, that he speaks of as the dispensation of the fullness of times. But the glorious thing that you and I are in preparation for is the glorious appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering unto him and our ruling and reigning with him as he reigns from the city of Jerusalem for the millennium, for the thousand years, after which, at the end of which, the eternal God puts evil entirely away. The enemy of mankind is taken and thrown into eternal torment, into the place that the God refers to as the lake of fire. 
and sin and death and hell and every contemptible thing that has plagued humanity since the fall is gone from us forever and the eternal God brings his city into the environs of planet Earth and men have access to the city and we are told now that the tabernacle of God is with men and he or God will dwell among us and then we shall be in eternal glory. That is the teaching of the word of God. The fall of man and the entrance of sin took place when our first parents disobeyed God in the garden. And it's incredible that God has a plan. The Bible is very interesting, you know. It moves from Genesis to Revelation. And in Genesis, we have the beginnings of the creation. In the Revelation, we have the wind-up of things where God creates a new heaven and a new earth. We have the beginning of uh, life. We have the end of life for those who have rejected Almighty God. We have the beginning of sin. And in the Revelation, we have the end of sin. There'll be no more sin. Nothing that defiles. We will be in a new existence. In the Revelation, we have uh, the answer to what happened in Genesis. The Word of God is most interesting. And this epistle to the Ephesians is walking us, really, as believers toward the glorious end that God has forecast for us. It is glorious, really. In Genesis, we have the first mention of man's disobedience in the glory there'll be nothing but obedience in the revel in, in the book of genesis we have the serpent loosed in revelation the, we have the serpent bound it's marvelous the word of god and this epistle to the ephesians really, we could say, summarizes what our relationship is to Almighty God and what it leads to. The glorious day, the dispensation of the fullness of times, when uh, God gathers together in one all things in Christ. So we were, we were further along teaching beginning in the second chapter where it says that we have been given new life. And you, speaking to the church, has he quickened or made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins. And then it describes our lifestyle of trespasses and sins. Wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world, Everybody did what came naturally, and it's still the case of human uh, existence. People do generally what comes naturally. You have he made alive, who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince and power of the air. We were all influenced by Satan. It began in the garden, remember? We walked according to the prince and power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the children of disobedience. All of the mayhem and all of the evils that are around us today are traceable to the influence of principalities and powers and the rulers of the darkness of this age against spiritual wickedness in the heavenlies. They all have their origin under Satan. There is a real spirit called Satan, the devil, the evil one, the blasphemer. He is influencing the world that does not go toward Almighty God through his son, Jesus Christ, who visited us on planet Earth. 
God was personally present, the Amplified says. God was personally present in Messiah Jesus, reconciling and restoring the world to favor with himself, not holding against men or counting against men their trespasses, but canceling them. That's the gospel in its essence. God visited us in the person of his son because we were influenced, we were ourselves, we subordinated ourselves to the arch enemy of Almighty God. And make no mistakes about it. Uh, I, I got into it the last time right about here because it's so terribly true and so important to our understanding of the times in which we live. Nothing has been in the world quite the same. The world has been undergoing a serious change. People have been uh, uh, accepting and endorsing what the Bible plainly calls evil and sin. We are being influenced by what will devastate our world if God does not give us a, a brief break here so that we can proclaim with the Holy Spirit sent down from heaven the fact that we may turn from our wicked ways unto the Lord. Where America goes has its impact on the world and it has to be so. Because this nation was raised up by Almighty God. It was raised up as a nation under God. And God has blessed us and caused us to gallop ahead of the rest of the world. And today we are in serious times. Unforeseen things have come upon us. We have not even been able routinely to elect a president. It is being contested in the courts. And may Almighty God move upon the people of God in his mercy and put upon the church of Jesus Christ intercession, serious intercession, because only as we implore God and God shows us mercy, can we ever be what God wants us to be. This nation is special. It is special. Whether or not you believe it, I'm telling you, it is special because the nation was founded in answer to persecution of God's people in Europe. That was the primary thing at the core of the thinking when the nation was founded, when the Constitution was written. That was the primary thing. Make no mistakes about it. Almighty God deals with men in nations. That's God's way of manifesting himself, revealing himself to the human family. When man tried to do it on his own and said, we are the ones, we've got the power, we will run things, build the Tower of Babel, God said, no, no, no. I run the things that concern humanity. I put mankind on planet Earth. We are not our own. We are bought with a price. And Almighty God confounded the language at Babel, and God made the nations. The reason that different nations speak different languages is that Almighty God wanted it so. God said that man must not run the show. And so we are in trouble because of this truth. We walk, we've been walking according to the course of this world, according to the spirit and power of the air, the spirit that now works right now at work in the children of disobedience. We, we have come to the day where we know that huge parts of this nation wants no part of God. I am not a politician. I'm not into politics. I believe that God wants to speak his heart into Republicans and Democrats and Independents or whatever else. 
God wants to put his principles, his ideas in the hearts of humankind on this earth so that we would reflect the mind of Almighty God in our public life. Uh, as my son-in-law pointed out, and uh, I have added one more thing to what he said, God has, uh, there is in our human existence, different laws, civic laws. That's what the government uh, puts out in the parliaments and in the congresses of this world. And there are moral laws moral laws. There are some things that God tells us are wrong and everything about our human existence tells us that some things are wrong. It's wrong to steal. Uh, you know, you, you're in your home and someone shows up with a gun and tells you, give me the key to your car and drives off with your car. <laughs> we don't need a revelation to know that that's wrong. To know that some things are right and some things are wrong are built into the constitution of human nature. And that's all there is to that. It's wrong to, to abuse children. That is something that's built into the constitution of human nature. It's wrong to disrespect and assault old people. That is something that's built into the constitution of human nature. And God has made, allowed humankind to govern, them, govern themselves. God has done this by establishing civil laws. It tells us that rulers are servants of God, ministers of God, to reward good and punish evil. God says so in his word. And the, 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 the Word of God teaches us that we are to be flowing in those civic laws, obeying those that are in authority, and the moral laws are built in. And there are also, in the Old Testament, ceremonial laws that the people under that dispensation knew that God required certain things ceremonially in their everyday life. The worship of God, the bringing of offerings, the offering up of animals, and so on. Ceremonial laws that they were under God responsible to make happen. Some of those have been upstaged by the fact that Almighty God has given us one true, perfect, and sufficient sacrifice in the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world so that we are not definitely, the Word of God is crystal clear, we are not bound by the ceremonial laws in the same ways the Jews were. And they are not but they, did, they didn't know it, they're beginning to know it now, that Jesus, our Lord, has provided that one full, perfect, and sufficient sacrifice. Praise the Lord. Well, let's go on in the second chapter of, of the book of Ephesians. It says, uh, we walk according to the prince of this world, prince and power of the air, the spirit, see, demons and devils are spirit beings. They are fallen angels. There's Satan, the devil, the fallen cherub, uh, the anointed cherub that cover, and there are those who attach themselves to him in his rebellion, and there are evil spirits that are in control of the wickedness that is in our world today. And uh, among whom we were by nature, rather, the children of wrath, the Word of God says. We walked after this Prince and power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the children of disobedience, among whom we all had our manner of life or conversation in times past, in the lusts of the flesh, 
fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, east and of other. That is a, an apt description of our world outside of Christ. That is the world outside of Christ. If you are not into Christ, if you are not submitting to Christ, if you are not submitting to the Word of God uh, through the inspiration and direction of the Holy Spirit, this is your lifestyle whether you want to acknowledge it or not. Your, the Word of God says that we are walking after the manner of this world. Uh, we, we, in time past, walked in the lusts of the flesh, fulfilling the, des the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, the children of damnation. Without Christ, the world is hell-bound, and it is as simple as that. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Jesus says, I am the way, the way, the truth, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. All who are un in, uh, opposed to that idea are responsive, are responding to the spirit that is now at work in the children of disobedience. Either you're walking in truth, and Jesus said the truth is personified. I am the truth. Either you're walking after the truth, or you've missed it, and you need to come and realize the condition of humanity without Christ and submit to him as Savior and Lord and the only means, the only means whereby we must be saved. Praise God for Jesus Christ, his Son, our Savior. We walk according to the course of this world, according to the Prince and Paul of the air, the spirit that is now working in the children of disobedience, among whom we all had our manner of life. In, the, in time past, in the lusts of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, the children of wrath, even as others. But God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love, wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, has made us alive together with Christ by grace, are you saved by something in the eternal God, motivated by who he is? God is love. God does never, ever act outside of love because God is love. And that is something that we must accept or confess that there is something at the heart of everything that is not love. God is love. God, because of his great love, wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, has made us alive together with Christ. When God allowed his son Jesus Christ to die, it was our sins that put him on that cross. And because of human sinfulness and wickedness, the Son of God expired on the cross. Jesus was not subject to death, except that he volunteered, voluntarily laid down his life. He says, no man takes my life from me. I have power to lay it down and to take it up again. Jesus of Nazareth, the only person that walked on planet Earth that had the ability to dismiss his own spirit. He yielded up the ghost, the spirit. He yielded it up. Praise Almighty God. And the fact is that w w without our sins being laid on him, Jesus was immortal. 
because he did no sin, neither was any deceit in his mouth, because that was so, he could have lived on. He said, no man takes my life from me. I have power to lay it down, or to take it up again. And he chose to lay it down. Why? Because he had an agreement with his father that he would take upon himself the sins of the world. That's why it was possible for him to say, it is finished, and to bow his head on that cross and die. There was no death for Jesus because death comes through sin. And Jesus is the one of whom the, the word of God speaks, who knew no sin. Neither was any guile, nothing that defiles in his mouth. The sinless one. And the reason he died is that your sins and mine were put upon him. He was willing. It wasn't easy for him. In the Garden of Gethsemane, he cried to the Father, Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. You see, he realized that he who came from the Holy God, who was one, the Word of God says, who was eternally with the Holy God, the one who was in the bosom of Almighty God, the one who said of himself, he that has seen me has seen the Father. He would never have died except that he became associated with sin on the cross. Not that he committed any, but that in God's love for us, God said that he would allow his son to take the, the guilt and the penalty of our sins upon himself. And when that happened, he became subject to death because the wages, the payoff of sin is death. When sin's payday comes along, death comes with it. And that's why Jesus descended into the lower parts where Satan the devil and his crowd are. But because he had done no sin and because he had allowed Satan, what Satan had put upon the family to come on him, he walked down there and embarrassed them. The word of God says he made a show of them openly. He embarrassed them and threw sin back at the devil where it came from and walked away along with his people whose sins he had taken. And he tells us now, it is finished. The only thing you and I have to do is to accept it. That's the gospel. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And that means that there are no, God is no respecter of persons from the, the head on down. Everyone comes to Jesus the same way. The ground is level, someone says. The ground is level at the foot of the cross. Great and small, rich and poor, black, white, brown, yellow, whoever, all have sinned. That's what we have in common. And uh, today, the church of Jesus Christ has that message. And the church of Jesus Christ, God will hold us responsible if we don't say to high and low, rich and poor, to all mankind, that this is it. We must, we must come to Jesus Christ or we live in God's displeasure and God's disfavor and the consequences, the real consequences of sin awaits us. Jesus said it's really simple. There are two roads. One described as wide and the entrance is wide and many are on that road. The other is narrow and the entrance is narrow and few, comparatively few, 
are on that road. The vast majority of humanity is lost. And that's why we must repent and be converted, changed over what did not infest us. God's activity among us. Christ's redemptive work by which he buys us back to God's favor and mercy. That, beloved, is decidedly what is offered to us. That's why in these days our business is to shout it from the housetop. It's time for us to tell the senators and the congressmen you all are obligated under Almighty God. It's God that has allowed you to be in your positions. And you'd better not reject God, and you'd better not want God out of the, the everyday stream of life of the nation. You'd better not have anything against the church of Jesus Christ. Or God will really judge us. If we think that God may be judging us or not, saying he is with coronavirus and another things that are upon us. You don't know anything yet. You ought to read the book of Revelation and see when God decides, all right, it's my turn now, and tells the angels, pour out the vessels of my wrath on, 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 on the world. And when God begins to visit the Antichrist and all who have taken, uh, who have pledged allegiance to him, it's coming. It's coming, by the way. That's what God's words speak of in Ephesians when it says that we are to be able to withstand in the evil day. It's in that day when the Antichrist, the one who comes from the bottomless pit, he is an emissary of Satan the devil, just as Jesus our Lord was an emissary of the eternal holy God. This man that will take over, I believe, the United Nations and be the root world leader in the new world order. It's coming. We have it on our dollar bills. Uh, order seclorum. One world order. That's it. That's what we wanted. That's what many have wanted from the foundation of the nation and what was put in our dollar bill. One world order. New world order. Novus ordo seclorum. That, that's on your dollar bill. Take out a one dollar bill and look at it. It says that that's what they wanted, and they've been working toward it, and make no mistakes about it. Discerning men and women can see today that that's what they want. They don't want us to be a nation so that we identify as nationals, and that's because the devil from hell doesn't want the Jewish people identified as a nation that through which Almighty God has brought his son to save the world. That's what the devil's program is. That's why the word of God speaks of spiritual wickedness in the heavenlies. That's what we're into. May Almighty God open your eyes and may God begin to speak to the powers that be. You can't sin against God. You can't hate the church. You can't hate the gospel. You can't hate what the, what the word of God calls evil. You can't love it and you can't love what the word of God calls calls sin, what the Word of God calls good, you can't hate it, and what the Word of God calls evil, you can't love it, and we'd better get, we'd better get our act together, because God does not speak and not follow through with what he says. When I say unto the wicked, you will surely die, that means you'll surely perish. When I say unto the wicked, you will surely die, and you do not speak to warn the wicked of the error of his way, the same wicked man will die in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at your hands. Woe is unto us if we do not preach the gospel. And the gospel is not only about the blessings the gospel is not a gospel of prosperity, although the gospel, if you obey the gospel, you will prosper. The gospel is not about social justice, although if the powers that be 
follow the, the gospel, there will be social justice. The gospel is not about healing, although we are, in keeping with the activity of the Holy Spirit of God, able to walk to a large extent in divine health. Now, God gives miracles of healings, I am convinced, in keeping with his will, because God is not obligated to do anything we ask him. He does things, and we should all pray. Jesus said, and Jesus set the example, if it be your will, and that's really where it is. So, my brother, my sister, I leave this word with you. We are in preparation for what is inevitably coming our way. Don't let that day come upon you unawares. God bless you. Pray this prayer with me. Say it. May God help you to say it if you've never given your life to Jesus. Heavenly Father, say it. Thank you for sending your son to take my sins upon himself, shedding his precious blood on that cross. Jesus, I accept you as the answer to my sin, as the one who forgives me. I receive your forgiveness right now because you've already taken my sins. Thank you, Lord. I have my heart turned over right now to my Lord and my Savior. God bless you. If you mean that, do write me and tell me about it. You write to us uh, at Freedom Christian Center, or you can send me an email, WC 1044 at AOL.com. So love to hear from you. Oh, how it thrills me when folk tell me that they found Jesus Christ by listening to the word from us. God bless you. Exalted.